Good morning, Camelback family. My name is AC. I am one of the pastors at Camelback. And while we can't gather in person, we're excited to gather again on this Sunday morning uh, digitally and in our living rooms all across the valley to continue to worship God. Uh, just a reminder that if you uh, want an order of service, you should be getting an email, and you can download that order of service through that. Uh, if you're not getting our emails, go ahead and just uh, send us an email at info at camelbackbible.com, and one of our admin will add you to our list and make sure you get the information for next weekend. Uh, we're glad you joined us either way, uh, and we encourage you to continue to do so as we uh, navigate this season together. Uh, just one announcement before we begin uh, our worship. Uh, this Wednesday, we do have our marriage seminar. So if you haven't registered for that, couples, we encourage you to join us. It's a great opportunity. Uh, it is digital, so it's over Zoom. And so if you have any concerns over that, this is a great time to continue to work on your relationship, uh, even from a distance in that way. Uh, but we'd love to have you join us. That's this Wednesday. And so you can register through our website uh, and check that out. Uh, as we think about this morning, as we think about worship, uh, I was looking at Philippians 2. And in that passage, Paul writes that God exalts Jesus such that uh, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And with that in mind, let's sing, to get, sing today, uh, lead on, O King Eternal. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, as we come before you this morning, we thank you and praise you because you are good. The psalmist says, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Who can tell the mighty deeds of the Lord or declare all of his praise? And it's true. Even if we stayed here all morning, all week, and told all the good things that you have done to us, we still wouldn't come to the end of it. And so we praise you, our Lord and King, because you are good. 
Lord, even as we think about your goodness, we see all the more clearly that we are not good and that we have fallen short. We have sinned against you. You created us in your image to be your representatives in this world, caring for one another, caring for creation, and we haven't done that. And so, Lord, we confess to you the evil that still resides in our heart and that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, with our words, and by our actions things that we've done and things that we've left undone. In the quiet of this moment, we lay these before you. And we're so thankful that even in the face of our sin, you are still good. And you sent your son into this world to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin. You overcame evil with good. Speaking of Christ, the scriptures say, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, making peace by the blood of his cross. So Lord, we come again to the cross and we thank you for your goodness in bringing sinners like us home. And because we are so confident that, we are, that you are good, Lord, how could we doubt it after we look to Jesus? Because we're confident that you are good, we bring our requests to you. We pray, Lord, for families who are navigating this pandemic. And now parents who are facing the uh, uncertainty of a new school year, figuring out how to care for their kids with school being online for many of them. We think of marriages that have been under special strain during this pandemic. We pray for the marriage seminar this Wednesday night that you will use the leaders of that and give us open hearts so that our marriages, our families, our homes will be strengthened. We pray for those with physical needs. We think of Audrey and Dawn. We think of Connie, we think of Fred, we think of others who are known just personally and we ask for your grace to each one. Lord, I pray that you would give us strength and wisdom as we fight against temptation. We are in a battle against sin. And we pray that you would give us strength to do that. We pray particularly of the sins that are endemic to this season of isolation. So we pray for those who are wrestling with alcoholism and those who are wrestling with selfishness and pornography and other things that really... Uh, uh, come up like weeds during this time when we can't be together and we're stuck at home. Pray, Lord, for those who are uh, wrestling with their sexual identity. We pray that you will help them to hear your words spoken over them and to rest in who you have made them to be. Give them peace in their hearts. Lord, we pray for our search for a contemporary worship director. It's such a disappointment this week. And so we pray that you will lead us to the person that will uh, help us grow and uh, as disciples through music in our contemporary service. We pray for those who are traveling during this season. Keep them safe on the road. Give them rest. We pray also, Lord, for peace in our country. We see the headlines of violence in the streets and of division and of anger. And we pray that you would bring peace and we pray that the church would be at the forefront of that. Lord, we feel confident bringing these prayers to you because you are good. We know you're good. You have proved that you are good by giving us your son, Jesus. And so we pray the prayer that he taught his disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you've downloaded the order of service, we'll be singing in Christ alone together now as a response. Thank you, Guy. Sure appreciate having him on the organ and the piano. Well, um, as you probably saw in the email, we are uh, disappointed uh, because we were anticipating having a uh, candidate here for a contemporary worship service this Sunday, and uh, unforeseen events came up, and we were forced to, uh, to cancel that. And so we ask you to continue to pray for our search for contemporary worship pastor. This has been a long and challenging search. Pray especially for those who are part of the contemporary worship team who are spearheading uh, this, uh, this search. Well, this morning we're gonna be looking at 1 Peter chapter three, and so I invite you to open your Bibles or pull up 1 Peter three on your phone. And we're gonna be looking at verses 13 through 22. 1 Peter three thirteen through 22. And I'll read those first for us. This is what God's word says to us today. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, 
so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins, once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Let's pray. Lord, as we open your word today, we ask that over this medium of the internet, you will speak to us. And that your Holy Spirit, as this sermon is recorded and and sent out, would be at work in all of our hearts. Help me as I speak to speak clearly as I should. Help all of us as we listen to listen with attentiveness to your word. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, if you've ever water skied or been out on a lake, you might know the name Correct Craft or Ski Nautique. Correct Craft is the largest family-owned boat manufacturer in the world. But in 1957, when the company was still young, Correct Craft faced a crisis. They were awarded a military contract to make 3,000 fiberglass assault boats. And as they were discussing the contract, the government inspector that had been sent down to Florida quietly mentioned that he didn't see a special expense account in their budget. He was looking for a bribe. Walt Maloon, the president, a committed Christian, ignored that hint. And two weeks later, Walt found out what that would cost him, his family, and his company. Because of his integrity, as boats were coming off the line, this inspector began marking perfectly good boats defective. He marked 640 boats in all, over 20% of production, leaving Correct Craft $1.5 million in debt, and that was back in 1957, a large amount of money. So they were forced to file for bankruptcy. And so the lesson is clear. Sometimes we suffer for doing the right thing. Your integrity, doing good, can cost you. And it's not only in business. You might go out of your way to help your sister only to have her turn the rest of the family against you. Thanks a lot. You might help a neighbor, and then he steals from you. You may serve at church only to have people gossip about you. You welcome someone new into your group at work, and that person ends up taking credit for the project that you led. I know of a missionary family that moved to La Paz, Bolivia with their young children, and one of their uh, daughters contracted a disease which she would not have gotten if they had stayed in America. And tragically, she died. Sometimes we suffer for doing good, the right thing. And this is a challenge. We felt this challenge last week as we saw Scripture commanding us to do good no matter what. Look with me at verse 9, just right up the page. Do not repay evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. Peter is thinking about the same thing here, that we are consistently to do good in every circumstance so that we are true children of our Father in heaven because he is good. 
But that's really a tall order. How do you do that? How do you keep doing good when you could be treated unfairly? We can summarize his instructions in our passage under two headings. First, hold on to your confidence. Hold on to your confidence. And second, look to Christ. Look to Christ. Confidence and Christ. The first paragraph, verse 13 through 17, tells us to hold on to our confidence. And the last paragraph that ends the chapter points us to Christ. Hold on to your confidence. Don't waver. Believe what you believe. Lean on what you know about God. Be confident that God is in control. That's the point of verse 13. He says, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Now at first, it seems like he's saying that you usually won't get into trouble if you do the right thing. If you don't speed, you won't get a ticket. You get the idea. That is true, but there's more here. He's making a deeper point. We can translate it this way. Who then is there to do evil to you if you are zealous for what is good? What's going on here? He's building off what he just said in verse 12. What did he just say about God? Quoting Psalm 34. Verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, so who then can do evil to you if you do what's good? Do you see how those are tied together? If God really is watching over you, if God really hears your prayer, if he really is set against those who do evil and all of their plans, then what could possibly happen to you? It's the same point that the Apostle Paul makes in Romans 8.31. If God is for us, who could be against us? Your enemies may hurt you, but they cannot harm you. Nothing that is ultimately evil, that is designed to destroy you, will ever pass through God's hands. He's completely in control. Peter quoted Psalm 34 right before this, and if we keep reading Psalm 34, we see these beautiful words. Psalm 34, 17 through 19. Listen to this. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Not some of their troubles, all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Who can do evil to you? God sees. God hears your prayer. Be confident that God's in control. And be confident that in all of this, he will bless you. Look at verse 14. Even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, he's recognizing that painful things will happen even when you do good. Even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. God has a way of taking the hard and hurtful things that people do and turning them into our good. And you see that time and time again. Sometimes we see God's blessing in this life. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. But God turned it around. When they were older, Joseph said to his brothers, you meant this for evil, but God meant this for good. 
with all of their plans, there was a higher plan at work. Whatever people are planning or doing to you, God's plan is to bless you. And he can take whatever happens and turn it to good as part of his good plan for your life. As I was thinking about this, my mind went back to a friend of ours, of Lisa and mine. We have friends in ministry who served at a large church. And he'd been very successful in business, and he was able to quit his job and go full-time on the pastoral staff. And things went really well for a few years, and uh, we could tell that they were happy and fulfilled, and God was blessing their ministry. And then things soured on that staff, and it was painful, and they couldn't stay. Now, from the outside, it looked like they were being kicked out. But really, God was kicking them upstairs. He used this hard and difficult situation, painful, to promote them. This man became the pastor of a Christian school. He began serving on a number of boards for business and for Christian ministry and for the arts. And now he's leading an international ministry. God has placed him somewhere with even more influence and effectiveness for the gospel and, and personal satisfaction in his life. He took a hard situation and used it for blessing. Now, we don't want to be all Pollyanna because sometimes we don't see God's blessing in this life. Things don't work out so well. And we go to the grave thinking, why did you let this happen, God? It may be that he was sanctifying us in a unique way. It may be that he was growing a flower of faith in our lives that won't grow in any other soil. Beautiful, precious thing and things in his eyes. Even if we don't see God's blessing in this life, we can be sure that God will bless us in the future. The scriptures say that God will wipe every tear from your eyes. You can count on it. It will be worth it. The scriptures say these light and momentary afflictions are preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond compare. God knows how to bless you. You can count on it. Be confident that God will bless you and be confident in Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, a child of God, be confident in him. Look at what he says beginning in verse 14. Have no fear of them nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. Be confident in Jesus. Honor him as holy. In the context of Isaiah that he's quoting here, Isaiah chapter 8, Isaiah says these words about the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. And Peter takes those words that are about the Lord of hosts and says, no, this is actually about Jesus. Honor him as holy. Jesus is none other than the Holy One of Israel. Amazing words. And words we need to hear because fear is an enemy when we suffer for doing good as Christians. Your heart grips you and you start worrying about what could happen. And pretty soon you lose your nerve. Peter knew all about this. He's writing this letter. You remember when Jesus was on trial right before his crucifixion, the night before, Peter wilted in front of a servant girl. He had followed Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest and a servant girl came up to him and said, aren't you one of Jesus' followers? And big, bold Peter just collapsed. And in fear, he denied that he knew Jesus three times. The antidote to the fear of man is the fear of God. 
More specifically, Peter tells us to honor and set apart Christ the Lord as holy. Christ has all authority. He says that again as this chapter ends, that Christ has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Here's the amazing thing. Just a few weeks after Peter wilted in front of that servant girl, he stood boldly in front of the same Jewish council that had condemned Jesus. And he preached God's word to them. What had happened? What turned this man who cringed in fear into this man who stood so boldly? Well, over the course of those weeks, Jesus had risen again. And Jesus had been with him. He had seen the evidence that Jesus was alive again. And he had been raised as the Son of God and was now seated in authority over every being in the universe. And so the fear of Christ drove every other fear from his heart. And so that's why he says, honor Christ the Lord as holy. The great secret is that if you fear God, you will be fearless in this world. What can man do to me? And with this sort of confidence, each crisis is an opportunity to tell others about Jesus. If you do good and bless those who are around you, even when they mistreat you, it won't be long before people start asking why. They can't figure it out because that makes no sense. Why would you do good to people who aren't good to you? And they begin asking questions. Verse 15, in your heart, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Why do you live this way? What hope do you have that allows you to respond with blessing for cursing? Well, in the context of 1 Peter, we began seeing this hope back in chapter 1, verse 3. Turn back with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Notice what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. What hope do you have that allows you to do good when you are wronged? You have the hope of an inheritance that is safe in heaven for you. You have the hope that God's power is protecting you all through this life. And your hope is as sure as the resurrection of Christ. Guaranteed. So when someone says, why are you behaving this way? You can start to talk about Jesus. I've got a life beyond this life. So what happens to me here? It hurts, yes, but I'm living for something greater. And that leads you right into the gospel. This is not the time to be nasty. <laughs> You're going to be tempted to be nasty if that person's been nasty to you. I'm glad you asked. God's face is set against you, you heathen, and he's going to judge you. That'll get you real far, won't it? You don't want to give in to anger or to arrogance. This isn't the time to get even. This, when someone asks you why you are behaving this way, this is the payoff. Up to now, you've been plowing the ground by living a beautiful life in front of them. 
And now is the time for you to plant the seed of the gospel in that person's heart. At a time when they're asking and wondering and open and receptive. So do it with gentleness and respect. God may be using this moment in their lives to bring them to Christ. Keep doing good with your words. Point them to Jesus. He saved a sinner like you, and surely he can save them too. That's the payoff right then. So be gentle and respectful as you confidently talk about Christ. Keep your confidence. Keep your confidence, and then the second paragraph tells us to look to Christ. How do we keep doing good when wrong is done to us? Look to Christ. He's the great example of doing good to people who hurt him. We need the gospel when we're treated unfairly and people turn against us when we do what is right. Now, this paragraph here, verses 18 through 22, is one of the most complicated set of verses in the New Testament. In fact, I was um, talking to um, John Del Husse, prophet, Phoenix Seminary, um, and asking him to come speak next month here at Camelback, and I told him we were working in 1 Peter, and he said, oh, what passage are you going to give me? The one about baptism at the end of chapter 3? And uh, I said, no, 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 I'll handle that one. But it's, it's notorious, even with Bible scholars. So let me say at the outset that we're not going to solve every problem here. But we're going to follow the track that I think Peter is following. He's pointing us to Christ. So we're going to notice what this says about Christ's death. We're going to notice what this says about Christ's words, his preaching. We're going to notice what this says about his resurrection and we're going to notice what this says about his glory. And his example gives us strength to do good when harm is done to us. So first notice the unjust death of Christ. Verse 18, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Jesus' death was the most unjust event in the history of the world. He had no sin of his own to die for. He is the perfect, spotless, pure son of God. He was righteous. We were not righteous. And yet he died. How can that be? His death was profoundly unfair And it was profoundly meaningful. Through the cross, he did us good. He brought us back to God. We were God's enemies. We were rebels who were alienated from him. We could not come home. God was rightfully angry with us. And the dark cloud of his judgment, of his angry judgment, hung ominously over us. But when we deserve judgment, Jesus died in our place. He was our substitute. The punishment we deserved was on him. And his once for all death bought us salvation. It was completely unfair. He didn't deserve to die We didn't deserve to be forgiven. But he loved us enough that he did good to us and died as our substitute in our place. So now we have open access to God and can come openly to him as dearly loved children. Now it might be confusing here, uh, the words at the end of verse 19, of verse 18 It says, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. 
The flesh in these verses refer to Jesus' physical body, of course, and it refers even more to this present physical visible world. His earthly body died. And the spirit refers to the unseen, invisible spiritual world of heaven and the age to come. So what Peter is saying here is that when Jesus was born, he took on a body like ours that was fit for this world. And when he rose again, his body was made alive and renewed by the spirit, made fit for heaven. Supernatural. He suffered unjustly, he physically died, and he was physically raised again by the power of the Spirit with spiritual life in the spiritual realm. And that brings us to the preaching of Christ, verse 19, in which he went and proclaimed, and that is in the Spirit, he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Now this might seem like a difficult verse, but I think we can explain it clearly. Track with me. Start with Noah. Noah was the only godly man in the whole world of his day. That's why God asked him to build the ark. And the Bible calls him a preacher of righteousness. In fact, that's in Peter's second letter, 2 Peter 2, 5. So when we think back to Noah, we know he didn't just build the ark, he was also preaching to the people of his day, declaring God's will, holding up what was right and just. Noah was not just speaking on his own, But as Noah preached in those early days, Christ was speaking through him. We saw this earlier in 1 Peter chapter 1. Turn back to 1 Peter 1 verse 10. And notice what it says about the ministry of the prophets in the Old Testament, which includes Noah. Concerning this salvation, 1 Peter 1.10, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances, and notice this, to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. The Holy Spirit who inspired the prophets in the Old Testament and indeed inspired the writing of the Old Testament is the Spirit of Christ. So when Old Testament prophets spoke, it wasn't just them speaking. When Isaiah or Ezekiel or Noah and the rest preached and prophesied, Christ himself was speaking through them, by his spirit. The same thing is happening today, by the way, when you and I speak about Jesus. The Holy Spirit speaks through us. So what Peter is talking about in verse 19, in proclaiming to the spirits, is the spirit of Christ way back in time speaking through Noah. So what does it mean that the spirits are in prison? We should understand this as the spirits who are now in prison. They're the souls of human beings who refuse to listen to Noah's preaching. Noah's generation, they heard God's word from Noah and they plugged their ears and refused to obey. And they've been in bondage since the flood. So Jesus preached back then by his spirit to those who are still in prison now. So the same Jesus who died and rose again spoke through Noah. Peter is making that connection. This tells us that Noah was just the beginning. Jesus spoke through the prophets for centuries knowing that he would go to the cross. He foretold his own death and resurrection. 
In other words, for centuries, in Old Testament times, Jesus was doing good. He was speaking God's word through his messengers. He was predicting his own death and sufferings that would be for our salvation. He was brave. He was brave. He spoke bravely for centuries. And if Jesus was so brave, if Christ could point to God's salvation and God's word for so long and so consistently, then you and I can too. So when the opportunity comes to you to say a word about Christ, someone says, why are you living this way? Why are you doing good to me? Think back in your mind. My Lord Jesus, for centuries before the cross, spoke about his own death. He was courageous. I'm going to be courageous now. That should give you hope and strength. And his death wasn't the end. Peter moves to the resurrection. Picking up in verse 20, he says, eight persons were brought safely through water, through the flood. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as the removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ. The flood was God's judgment on on the sinful world of that day. And it was even bigger than just that because it was a sign pointing forward to the final judgment when God will finally deal with sin. God won't put up with our sins forever. Noah and his family were saved in the safety of the ark. This too was a sign. It showed that God isn't just going to sweep away his people with the rest of this sinful world but he'll save them when he judges the world. So the ark was a symbol of salvation pointing forward to what God would do through Jesus Christ to save us. The ark was pointing forward to Christ. Baptism is is pointing back to that same salvation, pointing back to what God has done in Jesus Christ, and that's why they correspond to one another. Both point to God's salvation, but from different angles. Now, what about baptism saving? Because it says that this baptism now saves you. What are we to make of that? Because we know that elsewhere in the New Testament, it says that we're saved by faith. And even people who never were baptized physically were saved. In the New Testament, people were baptized immediately when they believed in Jesus. It was one event. So when he says baptism now saves you, he's not just thinking of the act of being immersed in water. He's thinking of the whole event. You believe that Jesus rose from the dead, you pledged yourself to God, and you were baptized. It was all happening at the same time. And so he's referring to baptism as this thing that stands out when someone comes to faith. You believe and you're baptized. And when that happens, when you come to faith, you are experiencing the full salvation that Noah's ark was pointing forward to. His family was saved through God's judgment in the flood, and you are being saved from God's judgment through Jesus' death and resurrection. And that points us to the glory of Christ. Peter ends on a strong note of encouragement. Verse 21. He says, the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Jesus was treated unfairly. His death was unjust. But that was not the end of the story. God raised him and exalted him. And Jesus is sitting in authority as king and ruler over every being in the universe. Everyone. And this tells us at least three vital things. It tells us that death is not the end. 
God is able to fully bless you even after you die. You may think of a loved one who was never vindicated. A loved one, hard things were said about them. They lost their job, treated really unfairly, and they went to their grave without ever having that resolved. The grave is not the end. God is able to bless you fully and abundantly after death. It's not like a football game. When the clock runs out, the fourth quarter ends, the game is over. But that's not the way it is. Death was not the end for Jesus, and death is not the end for you either, Christian. It's just the beginning. The blessings that he has for you after death are not second-rate leftovers. (coughs) In fact, that is when the true blessings begin. It says in Ephesians chapter 2 that God has saved us so that he might show us the measureless riches of his grace in Christ Jesus for all eternity. The blessings that you experience now in this life and the vindications are just an appetizer pointing you to the real meal that is coming after you die. So when you think of your loved one who died and their name was never cleared, don't worry. Don't worry. The real blessings are to come. That's the way it was for Jesus. And that's the way it will be for them. This also tells us that our resurrection is sure. Since Jesus rose again, you can be sure you will rise again. You were born into a living hope through Jesus' resurrection. His life is the guarantee of your life forever. And this also tells us that the same Jesus who died for you is now ruling for you. Your brother, your savior, who loves you, is on the throne of the universe. The game is rigged in your favor. You can't lose. Christ has been exalted. He's gone into heaven. He is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. What do you have to fear? If you take all this to heart, you will be able to do good when people hurt you and you suffer unjustly as a Christian. You'll be able to hold on to your confidence as you follow Christ. When Kraft went through bankruptcy in 1957, the court ordered that they had to repay 20 cents on the dollar to all their creditors. But again, Walter Maloon's integrity wouldn't allow him to do that. And so he committed himself and his company to honor all of their debts down to the last penny. And so family members mortgaged their houses, they took second jobs, they cut their lifestyle to the bone Wives came in to answer the phone. It took them until 1984 to pay off all of their debts. 27 years to dig out of that hole. After a few years, they were sending checks to the widows or children of their creditors. Many of them couldn't believe they were getting this money. And more than one widow cried tears when she received their check. Correct Craft suffered for 27 years because they wouldn't pay a small bribe to an inspector back in 1957. Now, they own 10 separate boat companies. God has blessed them. 
Walt Malone didn't know that God would bless him in this way, but he was committed to doing what was right. He was a follower of Jesus. He was committed to doing good to everyone, even when the court said he didn't have to. We're Christians. That's what we do. We do what is good. We do what is right, even when it hurts. That's how Jesus lived, and that's how we live. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for these challenging words, and we're so thankful that you were committed to doing good to us, even when we didn't deserve it. For centuries, you spoke bravely, and then in the fullness of time, you came into this world. Now we pray that you would give us grace to speak bravely and to follow in your steps. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We'll sing hymn number 600. If you have the order printed out, he leadeth me. Another week together, each of us in the separate place that God has called us to serve him. And so let's ask for God's blessing as we go. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. God be with you this week. Go with God.